I'm going to tell you a little bit first uh, what I want to talk to you about today. Um, first thing to let you know is I've been working in the North Atlantic now for many years, for 20 some years. And when I started out, I started out in Iceland. Um, and I have, uh, I was working actually mostly on jewelry, dress and adornment and looking at issues of identity and whatnot. With regards to textiles, I've been working on textiles now for about 10 years, and this was sort of a, a bit of a fluke thing that happened. Um, following an excavation that I was involved with in a, a, a site in Western Iceland um, that had a lot of textiles, and we were actually excavating a midden, um, which is the archaeological term for a garbage dump, if you like. Um, so what I want to do today is talk to you a little bit about my projects, talk to you also about my approach to textiles and how I work with textiles and give you a quick overview of a case study that pertains directly to uh, Viking Age, in fact, late Viking Age and medieval Iceland. Um, and then I wanna switch over and do, give you a, a quick demonstration on the loom that um, people used in Iceland. And this is an interesting thing because it's actually called a warp weighted loom. So it's not the loom that we're accustomed to seeing. And in fact, if I move over, you can see it's right behind me on the wall. Um, so I wanted to give you just a little sort of quick overview of this loom um, that was actually in use in the North Atlantic Islands, um, basically from 874 when Iceland was settled until about the 1700s when uh, the new looms were introduced as well as the spinning wheel. So they were not using those. And then I'm gonna show you what I'm currently weaving at the moment, which is a uh, piece of shaggy pile weave also called in Icelandic. So the projects. So I've had basically since roughly 2009, I've had three projects. Um, as I mentioned, we started out working on this site in 2009 in Western Iceland. A bunch of textiles came out and I wrote a small grant actually that year to sort of go and explore and see what the situation was with regards to textiles in the National Museum of Iceland and if, the, if there were other sites that had um, textile remains. And it turns out that there were actually a lot. So I wrote this grant in 2010 called Rags to Rig. The idea was really to focus on what textile production was in Iceland. And you can see that the time frame I'm working with, 874, that's basically the settlement of Iceland, um, till the 1800s is a huge time span. So it's not just the Viking Age and it's not just the Middle Ages, it also incorporates a portion of the early modern period. The reason for this is because when it comes to textiles, textiles don't tend to change significantly, um, particularly in, in non-industrial societies, textiles and dresses as well. Um, it's not like it is today where things are fast changing, fast fashion, uh, and we, we have all this sort of we're inundated with, with different types of cloth and different types of, of clothing. In those days, things changed very, very slowly. And so you can actually observe the changes happening when they do happen. And usually when they happen, it's because something is happening within the society which is triggering this. It could be environmental, it can be societal, it could be anything, you know, it could be migration or whatever. So after looking at Iceland um, in 2010, 2013, I then wrote another grant to try and contextualize this in other Norse settlements in the North Atlantic. So uh, to incorporate and see what was going on in Greenland and the Faroe Islands and parts of Scotland. Um, and uh, that one went on in fact, until actually 2017, because it was given a supplement to that grant as well. And I ended up actually going and exploring Norse and indigenous contact in the high Arctic as well in with relating to textiles and fiber um, technology. So the grant I'm currently working on is looking at the trade in North Atlantic textiles from these North Atlantic islands towards Europe, which is an area which is not very well known. It's been researched um, by historians a lot through historic texts, um, but not so much uh, through archeology. span So just to give you a little bit of a sense of the numbers that we're dealing with, um, it was really actually kind of surprising how much material there was in Iceland. And I'm estimating anywhere between 8,000 and 10,000 fragments of cloth. Now this is really uh, kind of significant because textiles are organic and normally textiles do not preserve well archeologically. Um, it requires you know, specific conditions. And there's other parts in the, in the world where you do find um, good textile preservation, for example, in coastal Peru and in South America because the desert helps to preserve the textiles and in Egypt, for example, and Iceland is another one of these places. Um, and so the numbers, and I estimate that I've probably looked at anywhere between 6,000 and 8,000 fragments 
It seems that almost every single site excavated in Iceland has textile remains in their middens. Um, and you can see in Greenland, for example, um, the numbers are actually not as big. I also should say that with regards to the textile collections in Iceland, um, they hadn't been really analyzed in a systematic manner um, before I wrote my grants. They had been looked at by various textile people, specific sites, specific pieces, and in particular, um, I have to mention the late El Elsa Gudjonsson, who worked on a few um, important pieces, like, for example, the pile weaving. In Greenland, the situation was a little bit different. Uh, Elsa Ostegard, uh, who's from Denmark, did a very thorough in-depth analysis of the Greenlandic material. In fact, I think we need to be adding pluses to all of these numbers because every time you have an excavation, new material comes up. So uh, this is why in, in Greenland, we've got 736 th to 1,000 plus because the, there's uh, frequently more material that comes out. In the Faroe Islands, the collections are much, much smaller. Um, and again, this is 142 estimates, probably a little bit more than that, but it gives you kind of a sense of the kind of numbers that we're dealing with. Now, one of the things I wanted to say about the Icelandic context is that one of the reasons why the numbers are so, uh, so huge, it's in part the way textiles were used, but it's also um, the way they are deposited. And they're often deposited in, um, in sort of as rags in garbage that are being discarded. Um, and they often, what they would do is that they would actually cap these middens with uh, turf. They had no wood, the architecture was a turf architecture. So you also find textiles that get incorporated into, um, into floors, into walls. And because the environment is turf, this creates a great environment for woolen textiles because it creates a, a soil that's very acidic, not so great for bones, uh, very good for uh, the wool and textiles and not very good for linen, for example. Anything that's cellulose based tends to disintegrate. So we actually don't have as good an idea of how linen textiles were used in um, that region. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit also about my approach to textiles and how I look at them. And I am not, I would say, yes, I do a technical analysis on them, but my real, I'm an anthropologist. So my real interest is um, is, is what are the textiles telling us about the society behind the textiles? So I wanted to just read this quote because I think it's really kind of appropriate. Um, and it's written by Janet Bur uh, Burlow, who says, as a mode of self-presentation, textiles assert personal, ethnic, religious, and economic identities. Textiles are also eloquent historical texts. They encode change, appropriation, oppression, endurance, as well as personal and cultural aesthetic visions. So the way I look at textiles, now I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, you know, their use, for example, in Iceland. They, in fact, in, I would say in all societies, textiles are extremely important. We tend to gloss over them. Even archeologists tend to sort of not pay so much attention to them, but they really are critical. I mean, they are as important as shelter, as feeding yourself. They keep us warm at a very basic level, but they do more than that. They're full of social uh, um, significance as well. And in Iceland, they were used really in all walks of life. So you find textiles are used for tents, textiles are used as sails, textiles are used for dress, they're used for saddle blankets, they're used for blankets, they're used for pillows, they're used for wrapping things, for wrapping food, for packing things. Um, they really, and these are the woolen textiles, and these sort of, they, they go through all walks of life. So they're really, really important. They're also traded, they're traded overseas. And this is, like I said, an area that is not well known to the, what extent the Icelandic textiles are actually ending up in Northern Europe, which they are. Within Iceland, and this is what I wanted to talk to you about today, they're used as money, they are currency. And um, they're used as currency roughly up until the 18th century. Um, when in fact, in, right up until the Danish trade monopoly, what happens is Iceland has no coin currency until the Danish trade monopoly. So everything is based on a barter, uh, commodity exchange type of economy. And textiles come to symbolize the, if you want the basic unit against which everything else is measured um, in the medieval period in Iceland, which is not the same in other parts of the North Atlantic. So this doesn't happen in Greenland or in pharaohs uh, by this, in the same way. <clears throat> and the other thing too about textiles is that in the Norse context, it is women who do the weaving. In fact, there's even suggestions in some of the, uh, the medieval literature that it's almost taboo for men to be involved in textile production. 
So it is really women who do everything from the very beginning stages, from the collecting of the wool, to the cleaning it, to the spinning, to the dyeing, to the weaving, and to the making of clothes. Um, they often also do this work in the Viking Age in secluded huts that are separated from the main house. Um, this is a very much of a woman's space, a gendered space, and men don't necessarily get involved in this. In fact, there's, if you read a bit about it, you'll find that often terrible things happen to men that go near um, any form of spinning or textile production in a Norse context. Now, this is not everywhere, this I'm saying specifically in the Norse setting. So for all these reasons, um, for me, one of the things I'm really interested in is the archaeology of women and looking for women and, in fact, finding women archaeologically because a lot of the archaeology that we do is about male institutions, about male endeavors, about male, because the history is written down by men. And when it comes to the archaeology, it's often what you will hear about. In the North Atlantic, it's no different. So there's a lot of work being done on, um, for example, on farming, on strategies or adaptation strategies to climate change. Um, <clears throat> but nobody actually looks at where the women are in all of this. So I felt obviously there's not a lot written about the women either in the medieval texts. And, and we're lucky to have this sort of substantial body of medieval literature. Um, so I feel that in one way, one way of finding women archeologically is to look at the things that they produced. And in this case, in the Viking Age, I'm sorry, not in the Viking Age, the medieval period in Iceland, women end up, in essence, making money. They're making cash, which is amazing if you think about it in those terms. Um, and so you, through the textiles and by using textiles as, as a way of finding women in this way, you're actually able to, to understand and to figure out the decisions that they had to make when they had climatic difficulty, how do they deal with that in textile production? And you do see elements of changes in weaving in Greenland, for example, when this occurs. And in Iceland, in the, in the question of the economic setting, how does it work for if women are making money and, and this currency is highly standardized, which is what we're gonna talk about a little bit in, in a few minutes, um, how they're making this product, how does this then pass on to the hands of men who are writing down the law books with all the rules and regulations of how this cloth is supposed to be um, used and basically in what, what settings and how it's supposed to be made. So it's a really interesting gender dynamic going on too, which I thought, you know, this is really worth sort of exploring. And then there's the question of dress, is that ultimately these textiles also get transformed into clothing and clothing is a very important part or an important vehicle that we have as humans to vehicle who we are in society. Where do we come from? What social group do we belong to? Um, and the textiles and dress in general do that. So for example, if an Icelander is in a marketplace in Bergen, Norway, um, in the early medieval period, how does the Norwegian know that this man is an Icelander? Most likely by his physical appearance, most likely by the clothes he wears, by the textiles he's using. And so these are really important things that we tend to forget about um, in archeology. span So that kind of gives you a sense of where I'm at or where I, I, I go at this. Um, and I, and the, the, the loom demonstration part, which I actually forgot to mention in the beginning is, is for me, this is the experimental part. I am not a weaver, but I know a lot about these textiles and I really wanted to also understand how the textiles were made, because this helps also inform your own kind of, um, it, your own understanding of, of the past as well. So I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, a couple of really prominent weaves that we find in medieval Iceland. Now I'm saying medieval Iceland specifically because in Viking Age Iceland, um, you'll find that the textile types are far more diverse. So there's different kinds of weaves, there's a use of color, there's different sort of decorative uh, elements added to the textiles. And by the end of the Viking Age in Iceland, this comes to a grinding halt. And all of a sudden, the, mo the most dominant textiles you find are the tabby or plain weave. And I'm sure there's many weavers out there who know what I'm talking about here, which is those who don't know, this is one of the simplest weaves. It's over one and under one. And the next type of cloth that we find is the two to two twill, which is if anybody has a tweed jacket, um, that is pretty much, that looks a lot like the Norse material I'm looking at, except minus the color. <laughs> but in essence, it's very much of the same sort of thing. And that's basically over two, under two. So those are the two main ones. And this is the advantage actually of looking at textiles 
over a thousand year period is that you can see, wow, the Viking age looks really different from the medieval period. And oh, when I get to the early modern period, something else completely different is going on here. So in a way it can almost be used as a way to create, if you wanted a chronology of textile production in these areas, it can also be used as a form of dating if you wanted to do so. So I'm gonna to talk to you now about this currency that I've been mentioning in Iceland, this cloth currency which is called Vadmal. Many of you have probably heard this term and it in integrates two Norse root words, Vav, which is cloth or stuff, and Mal to measure. So technically Vadmal is cloth made to measure. It's based on a standard. And it's very, very, it should in fact specifically be used, in, be used sorry, as cloth currency and not sort of a big umbrella term to describe all two to two twills, because it is always a two to two twill. It is always spun with Z warp yarns and S weft yarns. And it always has a thread count ranging from four to 14 warp threads per centimeter. So it is highly standardized cloth. And the reason why it's highly standardized like any form of currency is because it's money. So it has to be highly standardized. Um, and this is, the, this is what I'm gonna be talking to you about um, from now on is basically Vavmal and then eventually Varafeldir as well, which is the pile weaving um, that we'll see at the end. So um, the medieval sources suggest, um, and like I said, Iceland, we're very lucky to have a, a whole body of medieval documents of law books of, uh, you know, spanning the medieval period of also uh, saga literature, which I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with. And in the medieval sources, they suggest, um, they do suggest that all textile production is undertaken by women. And in the medieval period, this vavmal that they are making is used in Iceland to purchase goods, pay tithes, taxes, rents, fines, legal compensation. It's used for bride price. It's used for buying things. It's traded overseas. Um, turns out that Europe really wanted this vavmal because it was cheap cloth and it was affordable and they used it um, in all sorts of different settings. One thing to bear in mind is that in Iceland, there are no urban centers. So we're not talking about an urban economy here. Um, we are talking about uh, very much of a cottage industry. There are no urban centers. There are no guilds where textile production happens. While this is going on in Iceland, it's being woven on individual farms by women in Europe, they're already organizing textile production in a much more sort of um, industrialized sort of setting um, with the formation of guilds. And the interesting thing is that when it becomes more industrialized in Europe, it's also at this point in time when textile production goes from being in the hands of women to being in the hands of men. So at this point in Europe, they are weaving on flat treadle looms and they are organized in guilds that are usually the weavers are men. In Iceland, this is not all the case. We're still talking at the farm level. And this is why on the farms that you excavate, you find so much textile production, particularly in the early medieval period. Um, it also um, implies, and, and you see this in the law books, that there are also very strict codes and rules and regulations of how this stuff is supposed to be um, produced. If we could have the next slide, please. And this is a bit what it looks like. I like to call this my dirty brown rags. Um, if you were to take a twill, I mean, so, so not a twill, a, um, a tweed, you would see that in fact, it looks in terms of structure, it's made very, very similarly, um, except uh, obviously at this point, having been in the ground for a thousand years, it doesn't have much color to it. And it may not have had much color to it either. Um, that's another whole study onto itself. I just wanted to show you also, even in the, um, I told you that, that generally the, the Viking material tends to stand out as being really more distinct than the medieval material. Um, but you'll see that, for example, if you look at the frequency of how often the two to two twill and the tabbies sort of show up in the Icelandic setting, you'll see that even in the Viking age, they outnumber other types of weaves. And you can see that um, in the column on, on the, the left side, I guess. Um, I think it's probably your left as well. Um, but. And, you, and this is not, this is actually not a given. Oh yeah, well that's normal, that would be expected. Because actually if you look at Viking Age Scotland, the majority of the textiles are tabby weaves, not twills. So why in Iceland is it a twill? Interesting question. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the legalities of this vavmal, of this cloth. And according to the, again, the written sources, and one of the main sources for this is the very first one called Graugas, 
um, which was written down in 1117 to 1264. It is taken off of the, or heavily inspired by the Gulething law from Western um, Norway. Um, and in there, they have very strict rules about what you're supposed to do with this cloth and how it's supposed to be made and so on, which is interesting, something interesting to look at. Now, it's kind of interesting because in the Gulething law, um, the in this barter economy, they also have various rules and regulations of what you can trade and what against what and how much of this is worth that and so on. Um, but they and they will list things like butter, fish, cloth, a number of things that you can use. But the basic unit of measure is always silver. And it was the same thing in Iceland. The basic unit of measure was was silver in the Viking Age. By the end of the Viking Age, they ran out of silver. And this is when you start to see a distinct Icelandic phenomenon where, in fact, they replace the silver with cloth, with a basic unit, which is in textiles, um, still ref referring back to the silver, if there was silver to be had. Um, but eventually, as you move through the Middle Ages, they stop talking about silver, and it's just vavmal, vavmal, vavmal. So that becomes the basic unit of measure. So I'm just going to, to give you a sense, uh, Icelandic vavmal or vavmal, the term, if you just want to refer to a two to two twill, it's called friskeft, which refers to the three heddles that you need on the warp weighted loom. And um, in Graugas, generally, they would use the unit called the L, which they also used in England. And that was equivalent to 49.2 centimeters, or if you want, your forearm as well is also, in fact, it was often thought that it was the king's forearm that was, uh, particularly in England, that was the L. So the legal unit of Vavmal was to measure two Ls long, which would be basically one meter wide, uh, sorry, two Ls wide, and um, with the L equal to 49.2 centimeters during the medieval per period by six Ls in length. So basically one meter by three meters if we're using the, the metric system. That is basically considered the one ounce units or a rear, and it was equivalent to one ounce of silver. And this is very, very specific in the law code. Now the L itself underwent changes and you find, for example, in 1100, they have an L that was set at 56 centimeters. So it's a little bit bigger. It was replacing an earlier L at 46 centimeters, which was then eventually replaced by the 49.2 centimeter L. And some scholars have regarded these changes as basically periods of inflation um, or stresses either within Iceland or international trade with places like England where they're also using the L as well. And in Buolog, which is a slightly later uh, law book um, from the 13th century, um, mentions continuous modifications of the L over time and stipulates that Vavmal had to be woven in panels of 3.5 Ls in width, so roughly a meter and a half instead of the meter in the um, earlier period. So it gives you kind of a sense of, of how this is regulated, that this is not just, this is not just, oh, I'm weaving a piece of cloth here, take it. No, it, it is money, so it is standardized and it has to be made in a specific way. And this is very strict. So I just wanted to mention also that in Graugas, they also mention in one of the passages under a heading called lawful measures, it says that they use a stika, which is I think what this man is holding at the bottom here to measure cloth. And that this measuring tool was one tenth of a 20 L length and it was marked on the church at Thingvetlir in where the all thing is, if any has been, anyone's been to Southern Iceland. And this was um, around 1200. And so these, these were sort of standardized lengths that were established so people could come and measure their, if you want, their, uh, their textiles. There's also penalties. If you made bad vavmal and you made vavmal that wasn't according to the legal standards, you could be outlawed. And there's a case actually, and it's not only actually the vavmal, it's also the varafeldir that I will talk to you, the pile weaving, which is actually worth more than the vavmal. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. And there's actually the saga, the Jotsvendiga saga, that says that in the late 10th century, there was a Norwegian merchant by the name of Helgi, who was um, I guess docked in Northern Iceland somewhere. And he made a deal um, to purchase some cloaks. So generally when they say cloaks, they're talking about the pile weaving. And uh, he was purchasing this from a farmer called Thorir Akraskeg. And uh, Thorir came and delivered his cloaks and Helgi took off on his ship. And then when he got out to sea off the North coast of Iceland, he looked at the cloaks and they were all full of holes. 
So uh, it turns out that Thorir wasn't a very nice person, and I guess he got into trouble for other things, but eventually he was outlawed for his bad deal in textiles. So if you think about that, that you could potentially be penalized for making Vodmal that is not according to standard, think about what kind of power that also gives women as well, in a sense, that if you're working with your husband, you have to make sure that you're making your Vodmal up to standard. Otherwise, you know, your husband could end up, you know, in front of a, a tribunal for his, his, for producing bad cloth. So it's a really interesting, you know, sort of dynamic. And, and in fact, we need to think about that. We need to think about what, what was this, what sort of active roles these women were involved in, in the economy of Iceland. So one of the things that we do do, despite, you know, um, you know, looking at these and, and I do spend time analyzing the textiles and I look at them under microscopes and I measure things and whatnot. And one of the things that I do is I take thread counts of the uh, textiles and you could wonder, well, you know, what's that all about? And what's the point of that? And basically what you're doing is you take a one inch uh, pair of calipers, you set your calipers to, it's not one inch, sorry, one centimeter. And you count how many warp yarns there are in that centimeter, how many weft yarns there are. And this data I record. Now, we all know that if we buy a pair of sheets, for example, you'll find that there's gonna be this number written on the bag of your sheets, like 3000 uh, warp threads by whatever. And this is to tell you the quality of the cloth. And it can tell you something. And archeologically, if you record these thread counts and then you plot them, you get this sort of situation that we have right here. And um, I, I wanted to put these up. This is a, a sort of a selection of various, um, medieval sites with textiles um, that are all homespun, all locally Icelandic, all from the sort of 11th to 16th century. Um, in fact, the little circle should be moved over a little bit. It seems to have shifted in our moving of um, PowerPoints. But anyways, it gives you a sense that basically there is a tight cluster that you see on the screen there. And that tight cluster is basically what it's telling you. These are all two to two twills. This is Vavmal. This is the money right here. And they are woven very much all the same. And I can testify that certain sites like uh, Medrubetlir, that every single piece of textile looked, looked at was identical to the one before. I mean, after you know several days of staring at this and counting threads, it, gets, it does get tiresome, but they are literally identical to each other. Um, and that's an important thing because this sort of uh, research into Vagmal has been, has been uh, worked on by um, historians, Icelandic historians, uh, various historians, but mostly from the perspective of the medieval texts, again, by men looking at men who have written down this information, but nobody had actually gone to look at the textiles and see how were they actually made and what does this actually look like if you start to plot them. And it turns out one of the things I've done is to sort of try and compare the archeological data and the information I'm seeing and then compare it with the medieval texts and see what the difference is. So if you want to see, for example, this is again, uh, patterns, um, if you look at textiles from the medieval period from about 1200 to 1500, and then you look at early modern textiles, you see that they're completely different in their thread counts. And um, this, the, in blue, these are really sort of the, uh, this is the Icelandic homespun, this is the Vavmal, and it's woven between a roughly about four to about 14, 15, uh, warp threads per centimeter. And if you look at the, the early modern stuff, it's way off the chart, it's completely different. And the reason for that is because a lot of these textiles are imported and um, they're either imported or they're also beginning to produce in Iceland based on European models, um, more uh, elaborate textiles, a bit like, and, and also importing new technologies as well, where they're getting higher thread counts. Um, now, one thing that's interesting is that one thing I did look for um, was what do the medieval law codes say about thread counts? Do they tell us anything about this? And this was a bit more problematic. I had a bit of trouble with this, and I'm actually not the only one to have had problems with this. Um, Marta Hoffman, who wrote a very famous book called The Warp Weighted Loom, anybody who's interested in reading about the warp weighted loom um, should definitely read that book. It's a classic. Um, she analyzed some sources from the medieval law codes from Bualog, and um, she was one of the people who actually also looked at some of the Icelandic archaeological material from Berkthos Vatlin, southern Iceland, 
And she concluded that it was pretty inconsistent. There was not a lot of detail about the thread counts. It was a bit confusing, um, but concurred roughly a range between four to 14 warp threads per centimeter was probably the legal standards for woven cloth. Helgi Thorlikson, who's a very well-known um, Icelandic historian in 1991, wrote an entire thesis on Vathamal, looking at it from the documents. And he actually found evidence of different grades of Vathamal, uh, the first one being Gjaldavod, which would be the, the, the currency cloth, um, that was supposed to be between nine and 10 warp threads per centimeter. And he also found a mention of Kleidavod, which would have been the, the Vavmal used for clothing, which was 11 warp threads per centimeter. And then the finest quality, uh, Smalvod, which is 11 to 14 warp threads per centimeter. And Marta Hoffman and Elsa Ostergaard have mentioned that this type of cloth is the cloth that you use to pay taxes and tithes to the church. Um, so each one has got its use. And I have to tell you from my own experience of looking at thousands of pieces of Vavmal, I can tell you right off the bat, looking at it, which one is currency and which one is too high quality to be currency and what is gonna be used for packing material. So if I feel that if I can gain that experience from looking at this material, the women in the past must have understood this very well as well. Um, and maybe that's one of the reasons why the thread counts are more, a little bit more difficult to find in the text is because this was information that was kind of probably like a no brainer for these women because they understood this really well. So basically what they found is what I found archeologically as well is that the clusters focused between roughly four to five warp threads per centimeter is till about 15 warp thread per centimeters or 14 more or less roughly, which is what we see in this data as well. So I, for those who don't know about textiles, I wanted to do this before I go into the loom demonstration. I just wanted to give you this, I know I've been talking about it already, I should have put this before, but basically what we refer to as the warp yarns, and this is not for the, 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 the pros out there who already know this, the warp yarns are the vertical ones and the weft yarns are the horizontal um, textile or the horizontal uh, yarns, I should say. One thing I wanted to mention, I'm gonna re repeat this again, is that the looms that they used in Iceland, it's the warp weighted loom, it's an upright loom. In fact, it is a Neolithic loom. And this loom was used from the beginning of the Viking Age in Iceland, which is not, well, beginning of the Viking Age, not in Scandinavia, but in Iceland at 874 um, to 1700s. The very first flat looms or treadle looms show up in Iceland in the 1700s, and it's the result of the Danish trade monopoly. Um, and uh, the Danish, um, basically, colonial authorities who started to show some interest in, in Icelandic textile production. And they also introduced the spinning wheel. Before that, what is used is the drop spindle or the high top whirl, um, and all spinning takes place in this way, and all weaving takes place on this loom as well. And you can see at the bottom, you, you, if you look carefully, that there's these heavy weights. So these yarns are really under a lot of pressure, and that's how you create the tension is by actually hanging them from these stones. So the type of sheep they use is what we call the Northern short tail. This is an Iron Age breed um, that used to be found across Europe or Northern Europe, I should say, and today survives in Iceland and I guess a little bit in Greenland and uh, in the Faroe Islands. Um, you can find them as well, I think in some places in Norway and Western Norway, I think they're called Gamla Norsk. And the, this sheep has a real uh, distinctive feature, which is very important when you're looking at uh, Norse textile uh, traditions, is that the coat, uh, the, the coat of the sheep um, is, is distinct and it's got, it's, he's got two different types of fiber, a long and very coarse, very thick uh, fibered outer coat and a very soft, fluffy inner coat, which is almost like merino wool. In the Viking age, women painstakingly separated these two fibers and use the outer coat for the warp yarns and the inner coat for the weft yarns, which then creates, it also felts very much the, the weft. Um, the outer coat was called the tog and the inner coat was called the thel. By roughly 1500, they stopped doing this. And maybe even a little bit earlier, they completely stop um, separating them. When you look at early textiles, they're always separate, you know, and when you look at the later stuff, they start to basically mix, mix them together. So you can see here, this is a cross section of a textile from the site of Gilsbaki um, under an electron scanning microscope. This is an example of uh, basically fibers that were not separated. Um, and you can see the very coarse uh, diameters of the outer coat and then the very small inner coat 
um, and what that looks like. And, that, and today, I think this is what they refer to as lopi, basically. And it is because today when you buy Icelandic wool, you buy it, you don't buy it separated. You can, and I'll show you on my loom that that's what I did, but it's generally, it tends to be um, amalgamated together. Another thing to bear in mind, textiles in Iceland, um, basically throughout the medieval period until roughly about, again, 1500, all textiles are made with single yarns. Nothing is plied. The warps are always Z and the wefts are always S, except in the Viking age when they are Z to Z. The same as it is in Norway, actually in Western Norway, the textiles were in the Viking age were spun uh, with yarns that are Z to Z spun. And Z refers to clockwise, S refers to counterclockwise. Um, and you only start to find plied textiles used in Iceland in the much later period, around 1500, it starts slowly and then it increases. And it could have to do, in fact, with the fact that the climate also started to deteriorate. So it makes a more coarse and heavy fabric. Um, but otherwise, all textiles, all twills, all uh, pile woven textiles are made with um, basically with, with single yarns. All right. So now I'm going to, I think that's, oh no, sorry, one more slide. So again, just to show you Icelandic trade goods, we have on one hand the Vadmal that you have on the uh, right, and on the left you have the Varafeldir, which is the pile woven. And it is also generally made on top of a, or made from a two to two twill. Now the one I'm making in behind me is not. It's made on a tabby weave, but that I've never seen anything like that. And it's not like a flocati because it does look a little bit like a flocati. It is actually not felted on the back. It is woven on the back and the yarns are pulled through it. All right, so um, I just wanted to put up some of the legal guidelines as well for the Varafeldir because it's also uh, legally regulated. It's worth more than Vadmal. So the first uh, statement from Graugas here, it says in accordance with the General Assembly regulation, it's been standard value that one ounce unit shall be six L's of valid homespun that we knew. But the trade cloaks is what I want to focus on here is worth a two ounce units for, uh, for four thumb L's long. That's 204.8 centimeters, so two meters more or less. Uh, broad by one meter, um, and it has to have 13 tufts. So I'm gonna show you one that I made uh, last summer uh, right here. So these are, are the tufts of yarn that they're talking about, and it has to have 13 tufts across the piece. And if the cloaks are of better quality, then their value is subject to assessment. So basically these trade cloaks are worth twice the amount of homespun cloth, which is kind of interesting. Now I took a, I'm, like I said, I am not a weaver and I'm sure there's people out there who know how to make this far better than I do. I took a course last summer and I learned how to make this stuff because I wanted to do, I'm always um, interested in incorporating experimental work into what I do to try and understand how things are actually made and, and what people are thinking about and the decisions that they make when they are making these things. Um, and if anybody wants to take any classes on weaving on the warp weighted loom, I highly recommend the Osteroy Museum in Hordaland in Western Norway. When COVID is over, we can, uh, I recommend that you sign up for one of their classes. They're usually a few days long, a lot of fun. They also do a lot of research into uh, different knotting techniques in the making of this type of textile. And I gave you a little example. This is from their, uh, their research. Um, the, the method that they taught us, they taught us how to warp the loom, how to prepare it. Um, and they, uh, we were taught to use the Icelandic knot, which you, um, you can sort of, I mean, I don't think you can actually see this very well in here, but you basically, um, you can see how you under, you go under a few yarns and then you loop it and, um, pull it out. There's also a Greenlandic method and an Irish method. So this is also a type of textile that is being made all, all across Europe at the time. So I think from that point, we're gonna move over now to the loom. So I'm gonna get up and go behind me. This is basically uh, a warp weighted loom. I'm sure some people in the audience have got these. And um, this is one that was actually given to me by a very good friend of mine. And um, she, some of this actually, this is made out of Icelandic driftwood, which came from the West Fjords. And if you can see, um, I will show you, I'll reach down and show you, we have loom weights. 
And this was basically what the Icelanders would use in terms of loom weights, which are actually stones um, that they would find on the beach that are perforated. So there's certain beaches in Iceland which have perforated uh, rocks like that that you can use as loom weights. Now, in general, and, and if you listen carefully when you weave, you get this great sound too, which is actually one thing that she, this colleague of mine um, who gave me this loom actually uh, you know, pointed out to me that when you're weaving and you have this kind of movement happening, um, that this is, you know, this is sort of, a, it's, it's sort of part of the whole experience of, of weaving on these looms. Um, so basically the loom weights, ideally, if they're all the same weight, that's great. That doesn't always happen. Um, but uh, what we were taught um, in Norway was that if you can at least put the same weight on the back and the front of each uh, bunch of, of uh, warps that you have, if they're basically this one and the one behind it have the same weight, that is, is basically what you need. Obviously, like I said, ideally, um, you know, you would want to have, um, you would want to have everything sort of um, the same way, but that's not necessarily easy to do that. Basically, they, what they did is they showed us the whole process of setting this whole thing up. Um, and we are using, so I wanted just to let you know that what I'm, I'm doing, actually, I'm using, remember I told you about the tog and the fell, I'm actually using the, uh, my weft yarns, I'm using a uh, um, yarn that's plied, which is actually tog. So this is only the outer coat. I bought this in Iceland at one of the, uh, the wool co-ops in Western Iceland, it's quite expensive because it's a lot of work to separate it. It's very greasy, it's very itchy. The Icelanders have told me that they use this, um, or they used to use this 100 years ago for knitting mittens for fishermen <clears throat> because it's very coarse and very tough, you know? So anyway, I, I wanted to buy some because obviously I'm interested in this. This is actually what I'm using to, um, to slide my, uh, basically as, as, as a shovel in the sense to slide them through, and I'll show you that in a minute. And this technique of knotting them like this is apparently um, uh, taken from the Sami. So this is, and they, they sort of refer to these as little people. And so you, you can prepare a bunch of these um, before you start um, to weave. So um, what I'm doing here, like I said, this is a vatafeld. I'm doing the same thing as I did on the other one I just showed you, which is right here. Um, you can see that the yarns are a little bit different. So when we made this one, <clears throat> we actually had in the studio, we had on the ground uh, a lot of uh, sort of fleeces that were, had just come right off the sheep. So they were dirty, greasy, and that's actually what you kind of want. Um, and we were using a tabby weave on the, uh, as, as the base textile. And you can sort of see also here how they are um, spaced. You know, basically they're, you're looping them through. And um, the idea is you take the outer hairs and you cut them and then you rub them between your fingers. So you end up with little tufts that look like this. Um, so obviously I've been, this new one that I'm working on, I have not uh, been, I've been working in the house so I'm a little bit reluctant to bring in some dirty fleeces that might have uh, moths in them or moth eggs and stuff. This one, we washed it afterwards, um, but you can still feel it has a lot of lanolin and it's very greasy. And one thing I think we need to think about is when we're talking about the Viking age, we're talking about Viking sailors traveling around uh, Europe or traveling, you know, and, and uh, settling, let's say in the North Atlantic. This must have been a very, very important garment. One of the advantages of it I think it's more resilient than actually just skins because it's also woven. Um, but the other thing too is that this is completely waterproof because there's so much lanolin in it. And if we think about it, I'm sure that a lot of Vikings were actually wearing these as a raincoat. So I like to call these actually, the Vatafell is a little bit of the Viking raincoat. And there's a reason why it was worth as much as it was is when you look at the work that's actually involved in weaving these things, it's far more than weaving um, the, um, the twills. And I have to say, I haven't learned yet how to weave a twill, but that's the next thing I'm going to be working on to try and understand this. So I'm just going to push this up a little bit so we can see how it works. And let me see where we are. So I am going, now part of the problem also, the, the yarns that I'm using on these, these are also plied. So I'm not, this is totally not according to the standard of uh, the way it was supposed to be woven or the, the way I've seen it woven. Um, in, in, um, in the archaeological record. But, you know, we, we work with what we have. At some point, we'll try and make a really authentic one, you know, if possible. And actually, I wanted to add one more thing about the loom. 
is that when we start the loom, um, the way they start the loom in Norway and the way they showed us in Norway is actually quite different from what they were doing in the North Atlantic when they were weaving on the warp weighted loom. The North Atlantic was known as an area that would actually start out at the top with a starting border of, of tablet weaving. Um, and I did weave a textile like that, which had actually, it was a bit confusing to do it because basically my warp yarns became the wefts on the tablet. So, and in archeologically, when you see, for if you look, for example, at, at Greenlandic textiles, or uh, even sometimes in Icelandic textiles in the archeology, span you sometimes find these starting borders. There's even Viking Age examples where you see the starting border and then they start to weave. And in Norway, this wasn't as common as it was in, um, in Iceland. So I think I'm gonna, um, let me see where we're going with this. I'm gonna do a little bit of weaving here. I forgot I should have taken off my rings because I always get caught. You find that this cloth is very, very sticky too. It's very hard to work with because it is, um, it's because of the, the dual coat. Um, I also think that my loom should probably be more um, it's, it's a little bit too upright in this position. So my shed here is not very, um, is not very wide open as you can see. So I'm mean, now I'm going to open it. It's very, very simple. In fact, I don't know how to weave on a regular loom, believe it or not. <laughs> I don't know how to weave on this one. So I'm going to put some tufts in now and I'm going to show you how it works. So let's start at um, this end here. So, um, okay. So let's start here. So basically let's do three and, and you can do whatever you want. You can do, um, I'm gonna do three. They taught us to put them in as in three. So take three warps and then wrap it around like this. And then do another, skip three, and then do like another three. So obviously I'm not weaving legal cloth here, um, but I mean, you could, you could go and do it yourself. You could do it exactly the way they did it with single yarns against a two to two twill backdrop or background. Um, two, three, one, two, three. And so you basically take it and then you loop it around the last one. Like it's very easy actually. It's just really, really time consuming, that's all. And that's why it's worth what it was is it requires um, you know, a lot more labor. And you could think to yourself, well, you know, why didn't they just use the sheepskins instead? But I think that you know, this is actually much more durable than the sheepskins. Leathers don't really preserve that well. And in fact, archeologically, they don't preserve well at all. Um, and I think that uh, <laughs> this probably had more, more life in it than just using um, a sheepskin, is my guess. Um, plus, you know, the advantage of, of the lanolin and it's warm. Um, so you probably needed children in the, in the background busy making these little tufts for you to put inside your Varafeld. And you'll see that another really important tool on these looms is actually the beater. You probably saw me using it. And I wanted actually just to stop a minute and show you, tell you a little bit about um, other aspects of these looms. I had mentioned at the beginning that there's a possibility that some of this, um, you know, that a lot of the weaving may have been somewhat shrouded in sort of mystique and men were not engaged and it seems to be very much of a gendered activity. There's even some suggestion, there's a poem, very famous poem called the Daradarjov in Njal Saga, which talks about Valkyries weaving on uh, a loom. And in fact, um, what happens is there's supposed to be a, a big battle, it's the Battle of Klontarf. And um, basically this farmer is looking up to the sky and he sees 12 Valkyries coming down. They go inside the weaving hut um, and that, that, that is, built for weaving with a loom in it. And these, like I said at the beginning, these are sort of very gendered space. They're called dinya. And the 12 Valkyries go into the hut and they start to weave on a loom. And there's clearly some sort of battle magic or something going on, but the entire different components of the looms 
are, are making reference to warfare and battle. So of course you have the weaving sword. And in fact, in the Viking age, there's a lot of times these are made out of whalebone. This is very useful and it's for basically beating your yarn up. Without it, I, I'm pretty much lost. Um, the heddles, so these are the heddles here. These were um, spears. The pegs to hold down over here, to hold down uh, were arrows. And more importantly, the warp yarns were the entrails of men and the loom weights at the bottom were the heads of men. And so these women are clearly in there doing some sort of magical ritual of weaving on this loom, which seems to be like complete sort of um, association with battle and magic and death and whatnot and fate. Um, and they create this textile and then they cut it up into 12 pieces and they leave the dinya and they fly off. And of course, terrible things happen and they lose the battle. And a, a, a lot of terrible things happen actually to Christian monks and so on. So it's just, it's just I find that that, that sort of metaphor is, is really important um, for you know, talking about basically the ideas behind this. And one of the reasons why there may have been, in fact, associations in the Viking Age of this, uh, of this, this activity with uh, female magic, female space, control over life, death, birth, fertility, etc. cetera. Um, so that's just kind of a, an anecdote, a detail about the warp-weighted loom. Uh, 